Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Wendy Gillis, and I'm the interim CEO here at Kemper Museum of Contemporary Art. What a fabulous turnout. We are so pleased that you're joining us this evening for this very special event. We're going to be treated uh, to a conversation between Virginia Jaramillo and Aaron Jedgetts, who is the museum's curator, or, or director of curatorial affairs. But first, I want to take the opportunity to thank the many individuals and organizations that have helped to make this exhibition possible. And I know many of you are with us tonight, so when I say your name, it'd be great if you raise your hand. First, um, we are grateful for the generous support of this exhibition by the Beebe and Crosby Kemper Foundation for the Arts and the R. Crosby Kemper Jr. Exhibition Fund. Major support is also provided by the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts. Thank you to our lead sponsors, Richard J. Stern Foundation for the Arts at Commerce Bank and Joanne and William Sullivan. We thank our sustaining sponsors, Andrea and David Feinberg, Hales Gallery, Heben Street Family Foundation, Kirk Foundation, Mark One Electric Company, the McDonald Foundation, Pace Gallery, Matthew Petty and Jessica Hymas, Todd and Emily Voth in memory of Mary Odell Sweat, and Robert and Sally West. We also recognize Karen and Jack Holland for their support of the Visiting Artist Program. And of course, we extend a very special thanks to all of our museum docents and all of our museum members. And if you're interested in joining the museum, uh, you can do so on the website or you can visit us in the um, museum shop. And speaking of the museum shop, we have hot off the press issues um, of the new catalog produced especially for this exhibition, Virginia Jaramillo, Principle of Equivalence. That's being distributed by Yale University Press and beautifully designed by Miko McGinty. We had a tremendous group of writers who contributed new scholarship for this project, and I'd like to acknowledge them. Matthew Jeffrey Abrams, Barbara Calderon, Iris Colburn, Elizabeth Kirsch, and Courtney J. Martin. Finally, we're grateful for the institutional and private lenders whose works are part of this exhibition, and many of them have joined us this evening from both near and far places, so thank you. And now, I will turn it over to our Director of Curatorial Affairs, Erin Judgetts, and she is going to facilitate a discussion with the artist we are honoring this evening, Virginia Jaramillo. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I'm not going to read a bio because it's in the book and um, it's glorious and wonderful and I'll hit some really high notes, but I, I'd rather tell a little bit of a, a story of how this exhibition came about. So um, I met Virginia Jaramillo in 2019 uh, when I included her painting Principle of Equivalence in our 25th anniversary exhibition, if some of you might remember that. We started a conversation about a retrospective exhibition that um, I'm honored to welcome you to all today, which is also called Principle of Equivalence. <laughs> <laughs> Her history in Kansas City started many years earlier. Douglas Drake of Kansas City visited Virginia's studio in the 1970s in New York City. <laughs> wow, good. And shortly thereafter began exhibiting her work first in a group exhibition called Less is More in 1975 in Kansas City, Kansas, and a solo exhibition, Virginia Jaramillo Oil Paintings in 1977. Uh, two of those works are present in this exhibition now. In 1979, in search of new ways to express her challenging sensibilities, Jaramillo turned to paper making. Drake, Elizabeth Kirsch, renowned collector Dr. Leon Banks, and Philadelphia-based art consultant Carol Rubenstein championed this new medium, when many others did not. As a result, many fine examples of Jaramillo's handmade paperworks made their way into Kansas City-based private and institutional collections, such as the Dom Museum, Spencer Museum at KU, the Hallmark Art Collection, Kemper Museum, and many others. So this community has been a fantastic champion of Virginia's work um, since the 1970s as well. In 1981, Jaramillo received the Humanitarian Award from the Kansas City, Missouri Hispanic Chamber of Commerce as well. In 1994, 
Kemper Museum opened its doors and its first collection, ex first collection exhibition debut selections from the permanent collection in the museum's, in, was featured the new museum's new acquisition, uh, anonymous site 1603 from 1990, which is also exhibited here. Leading up to that moment, Hadamio's impact was felt in significant exhibi exhibitions such as her um, debut in the 1959 Los Angeles County Museum Annual, where she signed her paintings V. Hadamio, ensuring an unbiased critique. Imagine one of your first exhibitions as a young artist, being one of the most prominent museums on the West Coast. She was confident, fearless, and exceptional from the very beginning. In 1971, artist Peter Bradley curated two of Hadamio's curvilinear paintings, both together in this exhibition, into the Deluxe Show, one of the first racially integrated exhibitions in the United States. She was the only woman artist and only Mexican-American artist included in the exhibition. In 1972, she was included in the Whitney Annual as well at the Whitney, Mu Whitney Museum in New York. The significance of Hadamio's work has been affirmed in recent groundbreaking group exhibitions, including Now Dig This, Art in Black Los Angeles, 1960 to 1980 at the Hammer, We Wanted a Revolution, Black Radical Women, 1965 to 68 at the Brooklyn Museum in 2017, Virginia Jaramillo, The Curvilinear Paintings from 1969 to 1974, The Mil Manil Collection in Houston, Texas, and Women in Abstraction at the Pompidou in 2021. Yet there has not been a comprehensive presentation of her practice and impact before Principle of Equivalence. Throughout her life, Virginia has prioritized her artistic practice. Like Einstein's revolutionary theory of the principle of equivalence, which equalizes moving and inert energies, while we have the absolute joy of contemplating the arc of Virginia's career in this present moment, she and her, she and her work are of and from the future. Oh, nice. So I want to welcome Virginia this evening. And <laughs> that is so sweet. <laughs> It's also um, an incredibly uh, just personal honor. So um, I, it, this has been a project of joy, 100% joy, 100% research, 100% amazing companionship and learning so much about an artist I admire to the moon <laughs> and back. So, um, you know, what me, <laughs> I, I, thought, I thought of, you know, all of these like uh, kind of esoteric questions and things because I think that's what the work elicits, but I really think that it comes down to um, one of the most important, and, and um, I wanted to know what made you want to become an artist, especially an abstract artist. Yes, well, wait. Hello? Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Well, ever since I was a child, I was always interested in why people thought the way they did, how they lived their lives, and where their belief systems originated. And uh, I've always been investigating that. I was always asking why. And my parents would like kind of get tizzy and tizzy. We don't know, Virginia, we don't know. <laughs> so uh, it's just like, uh, I always wanted to be an archeologist growing up. And I guess that kind of transitioned into wanting to find out more and interpret these beliefs in my own way, it had to be an abstract way because there's always literal things. But uh, the abstraction was what led me to it. And it could be one phrase, one picture, one scientific theory that kind of you know, tickles my brain a little bit and I, I'm, I always thought, gee, I have to do something with that. And that's how I, I started. And I was always reading science fiction, yeah, which propelled me into some of the principles of equivalence. <laughs> you were inter very interested in making art in, in high school as well. You were pretty yeah. involved in some special classes that yes. you really had to push yourself to attend. Yes, um, I used to get up and be at, at manual arts around 7.30 because that's when uh, these uh, double X classes were scheduled to be performed and, and these were about students who were a little more advanced than the regular students. And uh, as a result of that, on Saturdays, we would make field trips to Charles Eames' studio. 
uh, and it wasn't mandatory and it wasn't scheduled. It was whoever wanted to go would appear and my instructor would take us all. I always, I always went, but sometimes there were only two students, sometimes there were five. It, it just depended on what you wanted to do. I think one of the things that really resonated with me was your um, interest in the Eames videos, and I encourage you to kind of think about the, the powers of 10 or Blacktop from Black 1952. Uh, yeah, Blacktop for me was, was it, yeah. And looking at some of the works there, it, it really resonates with the, the kind of scope of what happens yes. in the macro and micro environment and the cosmic realm and I know. how some of those elements come out. Um, the Curve Linears uh, were a major breakthrough series for you right after you moved to New York City in 1966. Um, something you often say about them is that it's all about the placement. Uh, the line better say something. Uh, yes. Can you talk about what you mean by that? Well, I became involved with the Curve Linear after Daniel and I came back from Paris. And uh, it, it was very interesting because at that time I became very involved with the Japanese aesthetic of Ma, which is the division of space and the space within that space. And that's what really prompted me to look at the paintings and start eliminating. And that line had to divide in such a way that with one line I could say everything that I wanted to say in that particular piece. That one kind of striking electric moment yes, it had to be yes. the right cohesion between color and line and how the space was oriented in, within the composition. Right, and too. there were a lot of sketches to get to that point for one painting. I mean, the dozens <laughs> of sketches, yeah. Uh, I think it was um, one of your really close artist friends who mentioned that it was electric, those lines. <laughs> who said that? I mean, Frank Bolling, I think, said that. Frank Bo oh, yeah. yes, yes. He was talking about uh, Green Dawn. Yeah. Yes, he said that line whipped across the surface. It was like a lightning whip of yeah. coming across the surface and kind of striking open yeah. a couple of Well, it of took spaces. me all day to, to mix that green, though, I, because I don't consider myself a colorist, so it really takes me a long time to get to the point where I'm satisfied with, you know, with what it is. You have to wait until the paint dries, because it always changes once it's dry, if you're using acrylics. And uh, it, it was quite a task, but it, it was successful. Virginia and I talk about this often, that she doesn't consider herself a colorist, but when we were in the studio and kind of looking at some early layouts, it was so full of color that we were like, oh, wait a minute, what's going on here? This is, <laughs> this is something un kind of unexpected when you end up seeing um, so many series of your works together in, you know, even on my terrible little SketchUp models. <laughs> I know, I know, yeah. But they end up being kind of amazing, and it, it, it's, a, it's a nice experience to kind of have that, have that moment while you're working with the work and have that moment uh, throughout this process, right? It's just kind That's of true. like seeing things that were unexpected about the work. I have to say, like, um, I had my layout, and I, we kind of went into the gallery space, and um, a lot of those things just had to go out the window because of all of the unexpected which I think is another part of the exciting balance of your work, is that right, right. the ones that you want to keep pushing together are the ones that want to be very far I apart know, from each other. I know, I know. It, it, it's amazing. Even the small pieces were so powerful. Well, I'm not bragging. But I'm <laughs> <laughs> it's, this is your time no, to no, do right, that. No, no, no. But, you, you know, they just kind of fought each other, you know, and uh, we really had to decide, well, do we take that piece out or do we move it to the end of the room so that they could have their own space? Yes. Yeah, we worked together on one of the galleries um, a couple of days ago and, you know, I was, I couldn't get it right and I was kind of sitting with it and looking at it for a while and, you know, having Virginia there really kind of broke a couple of things open with, yes, with, yes. um, separating some works that we thought were close friends. But they, <laughs> it they weren't. It turned out they're not. No, they're, no, they weren't. They weren't at all, yeah. Um, so in 1978, 79-ish, you decided that you wanted to move into handmade paper making, and you worked at um, Dudenay, which is a paper making mill that has fostered and supported many, many, many artists over the years. 
um, in embarking into moving into handmade paper making. Can you talk a little bit about what sparked that and what kind of helped sustain that practice? Well, um, it seems that after the, the stained paintings, which were in effect dissolving the surface, I wanted to step away from painting and I wanted to go into an area which I knew nothing about. I wanted to do an exploration. And uh, after being involved with, with the Japanese aesthetic, I said, you know, maybe handmade paper might be a good idea. So I went to Dudonne and I, and I looked at what they had and, and I said, okay, maybe, maybe the, but I knew nothing. I knew nothing about, all I knew was that linen had longer fibers than cotton. And this is what I, this is what I wanted to explore because I wanted to make the sheet of paper as thin as possible while it still maintained its integrity. And uh, so I started looking at forms which I could use in the handmade paper, which were totally not anything about handmade paper. And uh, so one day I picked up this very expensive stationery and I saw the watermark. And I said, oh wow, what if you were to expand the watermark to cover the whole sheet of paper? And that's how I got into this format that I use. And, there's, and you know, you really started with having to hand ground your pigments. Yeah, and that's all. Uh, all earth pigments are used in the handmade paper. How many? How many layers are roughly? Uh, well, okay. The when I would throw because I throw the pigment onto the screen, about seventeen layers of different colors. They interact with one another and we see what those colors perform or what's the result when they're pressed under 5,000 pounds of you know, paper press. Mm -hmm. yeah. So Paul Wong, who is, was the longtime director at Dudenne, oh, had yeah. said that uh, no one has made handmade papers like Virginia since. since. <laughs> yeah, or had or, or since. Had and, and haven't made any since and they're larger than a lot of people yeah, really. Yeah, right. I wasn't interested in the regular format. I wanted to do, do something which was different, which was monumental. And for me, it was really an experiment. And it wasn't always easy because I was dealing with something which I knew nothing about. I didn't know what the limits were, yeah. but that was good for me. You know, I was exploring. It's interesting, too, to think about it because it's like when you think of the curvilinears, it's sort of drop, dropping a line onto something. And in this, you have to coalesce many lines yes, of linen yes, together into yes. one sheet and really kind of, really yes. kind of make that sing. <laughs> <laughs> right. No big deal. Well, well, sometimes when the sheet wouldn't come out the way I wanted to, even after it had come out of the press, I would look at it and I knew it didn't work. Mm -hmm. But these assistants, which held this huge mold, they would just step back and just kind of wait for me to say something. And it was like, uh-oh. <laughs> they would just kind of stand back. And then, because I knew it was terrible, I, I would say, sabotage. <laughs> so that would kind of break up the tension. And I'd say, OK, let's do another sheet. You know, and it was like, yeah, it was interesting. It's interesting to think about, too, because I think your painting practice has really been about you and the surface, and then you invited people in to kind of like have conversations about the work, maybe like throughout the process or afterwards, but handmade paper making involves a lot of other people. Yes. The first so that time. was different for you. Yes. Uh, yeah. Oh, well, they were assistants, and uh, really nicely, they followed instructions <laughs> because I thought, okay, we're going to do this. And, and sometimes they say, but you already put 17, we would say veils because the pulp was so thin and because it was linen, it could maintain its integrity. So I would just say maybe three more and then I'd pick up three more colors, add more water to the bucket and keep, just keep applying. And that's when the most successful pieces came about. It was, it was you nice. pushed them a little further. Yeah, yes, yes. And, and sometimes they, I mean, sometimes it would take five people to pick up the mold because the molds were like five feet by four feet, and it yeah. was like, oh. My. <laughs> There's a photograph in the, in the back of the catalog 
that shows Virginia and Paul Wong and several of the other assistants like working over this mold and decal and just, it's huge. Yeah, it's huge. It's and it requires a lot of strength. Yeah. And it requires you to just be soaking wet all the time. All the time, yeah. <laughs> no, I had on those big rubber boots that fishermen use, you know, <laughs> that come up to your waist. It's really, yeah. But it was fun. I loved it. And I may go back to that. Yeah. After having visited them, I, I, I think that they would be delighted to have you back. <laughs> they were, <laughs> they, um, you know, they have a lot of good information and archive material about Virginia's work um, at Dudenay, and they just expressed how much joy they had in working with Virginia because she was so experimental and she really kind of drove the process in a way that hadn't been seen before. So, yeah, right. And that's, right. A, that's a big deal because there's a lot of artists that go through there and I think you kind of, you set the tone for well, that's great. being, I, I didn't know that. being experimental. <laughs> I know, I wasn't interested in just making a sheet of paper, like, but, but, but because I wasn't a handmade paper person. I wasn't making handmade paper. I was trying to create art. Yeah, paint, yeah. painting with paper pulp. Yeah, yeah. In a lot exactly, of ways, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> But not applying it, just letting it happen. Mm -hmm. Yeah, with the buckets of liquid and paint and pulp. It's beautiful. And, and I think one of the great things about Virginia is that she finds inspiration in something such as a watermark, but also finds inspiration in um, you know, something so, so big as um, ancient mythologies and different civilizations and things too. And so um, you know, throughout your career, and in particular, maybe, maybe a little bit more recently, in the new paintings, your bodies have focused a lot of attention on ancient mythologies and civilizations. What, what attracts you to that subject? Well, as I stated before, I've always wanted to, I was always curious. I grew up around a lot of different kinds of people, and I saw that even from the beginning, they all thought a different way, you know, different religions and everything like this, and I, I used to wonder, Wow, why, why do they do that? Why do they think that way? And that's one of the reasons I wanted to become an archaeologist. I wanted to go to Mesopotamia, to Egypt, to everywhere, you know. Yeah, I wanted to dig it up. It feels like you take us there in a lot of ways, though, like lit <laughs> but literal coordinates in the titles of the Oh, yeah, of literal the works. coordinates, yeah, <laughs> literal coordinates. Yeah. And then just kind of like, it, it's nice to stand in front of a work that resonates with a, a space and to kind of really feel what your reaction was to that in an abstract way. Always abstract. Yeah. Because, it, I mean, there are literal interpretations, but I wanted to present how I felt about it in an abstract way. Yeah, through color and line. And it, t it kind of really takes you on a journey from, um, you know, all the way from Greece, where you can see these kind of beautiful, shining blue colors, like all the way to places like Stonehenge, where you can almost really feel the, the texture of the stone and the feeling of the sky at the moment or something like that, that resonates yes. with a lot of your works. Yes. It's, oh, like, I a, agree. it's like a map. <laughs> And just to kind of close out, and I think this, this is an Im important moment because Virginia just opened up um, a gorgeous exhibition, uh, a Pace Gallery in Los Angeles of all new work that was made over the course of the last year or so. No, and the last uh, four months. Four months. Wow. <laughs> wow. Yeah. That's incredible. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what in, and as I move around the room, I think, and, and I hope many of you see this too, there are relationships to the square, there are these beautiful undulating lines, there are straight lines that go off into space and seem like they're gonna connect with each other and may or may never do that. Mm -hmm. And there's um, even such subtle things as like incomplete half circles that look like coffee stains on a table just kind of in different places around the space. Right. And you know, I, I wonder how you think about that and how you, or if you do, carry some of those things into what you're working on now and how some of the work that you've made over the course of your career shows up in some of the work that you're making now. Well, my exhibition at Hales Hales, I'm sorry, Pace. I'm getting so confused now. Too many galleries. Yeah, too many galleries. <laughs> <laughs> no, that Not sounds uh, that sounds terrible. <laughs> but no, at Pace, L.A. Um, 
I did a 15 foot piece, three panels, and it's uh, titled To Touch the Earth. And each panel uh, represents one of the early metals that man worked with, humanity worked with. Uh, one is gold, one is silver, and one is copper. And all that's uh, created with the method of layering sheets of acrylic, dried acrylic paint on there. It's, it took me months to do that. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And, and some of, I noticed that some of the lines in that work are reflected back into some of the works that are happening yes, here. So yes, the Song of Amergen has that quality, yeah. yes. One of the things I found so interesting is that the power is palpable from each work individually, but they sing together in different ways and they really kind of like end up supporting each other. And I think that, you know, the, um, the, more, the more you see them evolve, like they seem like different series, right? They're called different series. But as you walk through their space, you're like, you can distinctly tell that this is the same art, this is the same artist. There's a, yeah, there's a, a certain real sensibility there that I think is, is uniquely yours that you've carried through and into, into this nice. new work, so. Yeah, that's nice for you to say, yeah, I like that. <laughs> I like saying nice things about your work, Virginia. <laughs> well, I try. <laughs> Well, we are going to open, I mean, the galleries are already open, so hopefully you've had a chance to look at some of these works that we're talking about. But if you haven't, I encourage you to um, spend some time in the gallery, enjoy spending time with us in the gallery, and if you have any questions about anything, um, we'll be kind of walking around for the next hour or so for, for the reception portion of this evening. And I just want to say, you know, thank you. Thank you for like thank really you. kicking off this museum with your work. Oh, thank you thank for you. being such an important part of Kansas City.